appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Once again, my name is Lisa Mushet, and I work with the United States Tennis Association Northern Section. And we have been a longtime partner with Rick, and we've been to this conference, I think, four or five times. But normally when I'm here, I'm here with a big, tall African-American man who I think all of you maybe have known who've been here in the past, Tony Stingley. And unfortunately for our office, we lost him to our national organization down in Florida. So. That has been a big loss for our organization because Tony was kind of our community connector in a lot of ways. But that's also been a great opportunity for us because we realize that we all need to be community connectors. And so that's our goal. And the re one of the reasons why we're here, and it's kind of funny, this morning when I got here and I've been talking to everybody, one of the first things that people, or a repeated question I keep getting is, why is the United States Tennis Association here? Why, why tennis? Because, and it's okay, most people think of tennis as a rich white person sport. How many of you are thinking that? Okay, I think that a lot. <laughs> and I'm out there and I understand that and no one's brave enough to say it to me, but I know it because I can feel it. And so that is what we are trying to do is to break down that stereotype that tennis is only a rich white person sport. And so, just a little bit about our organization. We are one of 17 sections nationally of the United States Tennis Association. That group runs the US Open. You might have heard of that big tennis tournament that's in New York every year. Well, that's our bigger umbrella. And then there are 17 of us little sections. And we're the ones that are out delivering grassroots tennis programming and trying to introduce tennis to the masses. We are a 501c3, which most people don't realize. They think the US Open, they know how much money it makes. They think we make that much money too. I wish we did, it would make my job a whole lot easier, but we don't. Um, but our area services Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and Northwestern Wisconsin. So we have our challenges, obviously, because of the weather, so tennis, Sometimes it's only in the mind of people, maybe from May, April, for lucky if it's nice out, through maybe September in the outdoor season, and then everyone thinks, oh, we can't play tennis anymore because where are we gonna play? We have to move indoors and we can't afford it. So that's definitely one of the barriers that we have to overcome. Our mission as an organization overall is to promote and develop the growth of tennis. We have a large, we, do, we promote to everybody. So from the age to four to 104, we're trying to get anybody and everybody playing the sport, or maybe they've given it up and we want to get them back involved. Our vision is to provide access to tennis programming for all people, not just the rich white person, and create opportunities to enjoy social, physical, and health benefits provided by the sport of tennis. We talked about that earlier, health and wellness, huge initiative. Having a hard time really cracking that now. We're, we, struggle with that as well because we find that more people are on their devices, not as willing to go out and do sports, or we find that people are specializing in sports. So where we used to have a lot of people, the older people in here, I was one of those, where I played three sports growing up. Well, I have an 11 year old now, she's not allowed to play three sports because she has to play that one sport and we don't like that. <laughs> we want people to go back to being those multi-sport athletes for a lot of different reasons, but mainly because you get burned out and you need variety. Could you imagine doing something ev the same every single day, all year round for years and years? It just doesn't really work. So we're hoping that we can get back to that mentality of being able to try more things and be willing to put ourselves out there. We are a member and volunteer-based organization. We're kind of old school in that our leadership are all volunteers. <laughs> From the national level all the way down. We do have a staff here of 15 people, but the majority of our leadership is volunteer based. And then in terms of members, we have about 11,500 11, members in that four state region. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and like I said, or like Rick said, we are, I guess, the newcomers, so to speak. We always like to think that we're really diverse and inclusive, but we realize we have a ton of work to do. And so we're trying baby steps, but we're trying to get in the game as well. So diversity and inclusion has become a level one priority 
for not only us locally, but for the USTA as a whole. We are working with a number of outreach events. We do the celebration of the different months, of course, but is that enough? I don't think it is, but it's at least a start. We've got to start small and go from and build up. Um, we're also doing some specific initiatives and programs in the area that I'll touch on a little bit more, and then educational opportunities. So for our outreach events, we do 20 events scheduled. We have 20 events scheduled right now for 2017. So we're trying just to get out there. We want people to know who we are, but more so that tennis is all inclusive and that everyone's allowed to come and play. And so we've, we are planning on being at Cinco de Mayo, Juneteenth, Pride, Rondo Days. We've been to a lot of these over the years. And we go and we actually bring our tennis equipment and our little portable courts we set up, and we encourage anybody to come out and play. The hardest part about that is we give them a taste of what they can uh, playing tennis, but then where do we send them after that? So we're trying to find community partners, and that's one of the big reasons why we're here today, is that we are always trying to develop community connections and partners so that we can meet those people who can help us deliver the game in the community. Because we actually don't de deliver the programs itself. We depend on people out in the community to deliver programs for us. We also are very involved in adaptive events. We work with Special Olympics, Down Syndrome, the Courage Kenny Wheelchair Program. Actually, the uh, National Wheelchair Manager for the USTA is actually from, well, he was, he just left, but he is from Minneapolis area. And so we've been very fortunate to have one of the world leaders in wheelchair tennis to be from our area. Um, we also work with schools and community partner programs. So one of our big initiatives at the USTA is trying to get into schools and introduce kids to the sport of tennis. And we're finding that it's a little bit harder these days because as times change, budgets change, we find that PE is unfortunately one of the first things either being cut altogether or at least cut back. I know with my girls, they only go to PE one time a week for an hour a week. So it's hard to, first of all, get in there and get that quality time with those kids, but then to bring in a bunch of rackets and balls. And we find that teachers are a little bit nervous in doing that because they need control. They want controlled chaos rather than total chaos. So, but what we do as an organization is we go in and we work with those teachers. We teach them how to turn tennis into organized chaos rather than just flat out chaos. <laughs> um, we also are stepping up our outreach with corporations. We know that health and wellness is a big initiative and so we are trying to uh, go into these corporations and introduce the game of tennis. So we have some events coming up here in the month of May we're very excited about. Then we also are working, we realize that we want it really depends, getting kids involved in tennis or getting people involved in tennis really starts at the ground level and starts with kids. So we've actually modified our game. If you go back to our table there, you'll see that there are all these colorful tennis balls and these smaller rackets. Well, that is part of our initiative in trying to get more people involved in the game. Tennis is a really hard sport, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> the ball bounces over your head, you have to have good hand-eye coordination. So as a kid, as an adult, it's really difficult to have success early with tennis. But we've taken the game and we've modified it so that we can incur so that those kids or beginning adults can be su successful. And so if you go back there, you'll see we've got red balls, orange balls, green balls. All those balls are lower compression balls. They bounce slower, they move slower. So that way it's easier to hit the ball. There's a foam ball back there. So it's easier to hit the ball. That's you have immediate success, and then you want to come back for more. So we're working with Twin Cities in Motion, Girls on the Run. And then we just did a great event, and actually, I think I, see if I can go back here. The picture in the middle with the kids holding the tennis rackets, that's an event that we just partnered with our InSport Corporation, um, our partner with. We did something with the University of Minnesota women's tennis team a couple weeks ago, where we brought in um, programs that work with tennis, so Inner City Tennis in Minneapolis, the Fred Wells Tennis and Education Center in St. Paul, and St. Paul Urban Tennis. We brought them down to the University of Minnesota. We set up a huge play day for them, so they were able to all come in,
play tennis, and then they were able, they had lunch, and they were able to stay and watch the University of Minnesota women's tennis team play. It was a huge event. We had about 60 people, huge success. So those are the types of things that we think really are going to make a difference. Um, we have some special initiatives and programs that we've just started. One of them is a real work in progress. That's the first one, our Tennis Bar Totos program, which is in Minneapolis and Richfield. It offers free tennis programming to anybody, um, kids especially, but we encourage parents to come out as well or uh, and to come out and to learn the game of tennis. We're in churches. We have a schools program where they can come out, the equipment's provided, they can come out and learn the game of tennis. Um, we worked with a, one of the largest churches in Richfield to try and get this program off the ground, and we're finding that although the people who do participate love it, it's been a very slow go for us. Um, and so that's been frustrating, but like Rick says, it doesn't happen overnight, right? And so we keep moving along and pushing forward, and hopefully we're going to find what can get more people involved in that program. But it is a great program. We did work with Univision to do some advertising and put together a whole media package for us to promote that program. Um, we plan to do that again as we move forward. We also have an equipment donation program. So a lot of times we hear that one of the barriers with tennis is we just don't have either tennis courts or we don't have rackets or we don't have the right balls, whatever it is. Well, we have programs that provide equipment to people, but we also show people that you don't need a tennis court. We could set up a court in here with two chairs and some caution tape that we have and set up an actual playing area so all of us could be playing. So maybe we'll do that after lunch, I don't know. <laughs> Um, we also have scholarship programs that we've developed where we actually, they are multicultural scholarship programs that are directed toward people of those populations. Um, we've actually had relatively slow growth in that. We're hoping this year that we can blow that out a little bit more and have more people take advantage of that opportunity. Um, we also are receiving a grant from our national office with intern with an internship for our office so that we have a um, d so we can have more diversity and inclusion in our office as well um, actually it's been very exciting in our office and that we hired two people this week and we have um, they both come from diverse backgrounds and so we've doubled our uh, diversity and inclusion <laughs> representation in one week so we're very excited about that because we know that's the direction we need to go so um, volunteer recruitment this is an area that we really work hard with like I said we're a volunteer organization and so we really go around and try to encourage people to get involved in our organizations and um, so from our board of directors all through our committees all the way down to just people who might help us with the day-to-day -day activities um, we're really trying to get more people involved from all backgrounds and then probably our biggest thing, and she's over here, Christine Nichols, who works in our office, um, she formed a partnership with Youth Prize, and we have developed the Urban Youth Tennis and Education Campaign. And it's been a huge thing for us in that it's allowing us to bring opportunities to people who might not have it, and providing us some extra funding. As a nonprofit, it's really difficult for us to make a huge impact. So, with our partnership with Youth Prize, we've been really fortunate. We're working with what we call the big three, and I mentioned them before, Inner City Tennis, St. Paul Urban Tennis, and the Fred Wells Tennis and Education Center. And we are providing um, all sorts of different opportunities, as well as um, helping with transportation so that we can get kids to different events or the opportunity to the um, that in sport event that I just talked about we were able to provide transportation for that event as well we also were able to hire a community connector for st. Paul and that person works with both Fred Wells and the st. Paul urban tennis Association with um, help, just helping us make sure that we get kids and families to different programs in those areas so um, Another thing that we've done on a national level, and it's very interesting because when I sat down at the table this morning, David Morris, who's sitting at my table, said, I worked on that. I go, you did? But um, we've, the national organization has developed some educational tools. One of them is um, engagement guides, and we've 
they've picked seven different groups to uh, develop guides for. We actually have them all at our back table, but for African American, Asian American, Hispanic, Native American, LGBT, wheelchair, and millennial groups. And those are really good in just reference for people, maybe to provide some numbers, give some understanding of how these groups think. We'd like to think that we understand how everybody thinks, but we don't. And so this has been some great research for us. And you know, it's open and available to the public, so we're able to get it out to whoever might be delivering tennis for us. And they've been a real hit with our group. Um, the USTA also provides cultural competency training which they go around to different organizations within or around the United States. So it could be an organization, it might be one of our section offices, but just provides um, further education for all of us so that we can be better in our jobs in that area. We also offer online training courses and then we are trying to attend as many diverse marketing conferences as possible. Like I said, this is one of our favorite ones to come to because we meet so many people and we hope that those people can help us in just right, meeting the right people and getting the word out there that tennis is not just a rich white person's sport. So like I said, we're taking baby steps, but we're trying to do our best with a, on a limited budget. So I definitely, after the first presentation, need to go back and say I need more money after hearing that. But uh, I think we all feel that way in a lot of ways. Um, so we have a diversity and inclusion committee that's part of our organization and they have formed three task forces. The first one is a pathway task force and that one is making sure that when we hit these people with the initial touch of introducing them to tennis, that we have a pathway for them to follow so that they don't have tennis one time and then it's gone. That there is somewhere that we can send them to learn more about tennis or provide tennis opportunities for them as they grow on. Next is the Navigator Task Force, and that is developing those community connections and finding those people within the community that can help us in growing the sport. And then finally, special events. We're trying to get out to more special events, and we're actually developing some new ones. So this year, we're working on a women in tennis event for high school girls because we find that, especially with high school girls, once they graduate from high school, they leave the sport for a long time. And we want to show that even if you don't play in college, there are still opportunities for you in the world of tennis, whether it's as a coach or as a marketing PR person. I'm also an official, so I like to get out there and tell them that you can always do that too and have people yell at you all the time. <laughs> but it's OK, because you get paid pretty good. <laughs> um, then we're also just continuing our media marketing, advertising support trying to find new ways, um, keeping up those partnerships, and then further developing our community partnerships. So if anybody knows of anybody who might be interested in helping us out or can connect us to the right people, we definitely want to know who those people are. So, um, so I guess that's it. I wanted to say one thing about this little girl here that's holding this card. So this little girl, when she came to the inner city tennis program, um, I think it was three years ago, she was one that came into the program. We were able to connect her with some people. She did their free Saturday program and she continued on. And now she's one of the best players in our area. And so we've been able to help assist her with um, scholarships and financing. And she's now part of our Team Northern program. And so it's just a great success story. We like to see more stories like that, so. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for inviting us. We are new to the party. My name again is Pat Arndt, and I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager for Minnesota State Parks and Trails. And I always say that um, it's my job to talk people into going out to the most beautiful places in Minnesota. What job could be easier, right? <laughs> or more fun. Um, and since we are new to the party, I'm listening to all these themes here today, and it seems like it's a lot about collaborating and partnerships and those kind of things. And, um, you know, if nothing else happens today, I feel like the day was a success. I already met someone, Tony, from the Ordway, 
and we're having conversations about maybe doing some Ordway productions or having some events out in our state park. So I think that's what this is all about. So very exciting. Oh. You missed the fire. We were going to have you around the campfire. Now I'm going to jump into things already. We can always go back to that if you brought your s'more stuff and you want to toast a s'more. So just a little bit of overview, if you're not familiar with our Minnesota State Parks and Trails, you can stop at the booth in the back. Deborah is um, staffing that if you want some of our brochures. Whoops, jumped ahead. 75 State Parks and Recreation Areas. 25 state trails, 35 state water trails, and we've got state forests, state waysides, fishing piers, water access sites, and snowmobile, off-highway vehicle, and horse trails. It's a lot. There's a lot for people to do outdoors, and what we want to do is make sure that people avail of themselves of those opportunities like Rick mentioned. So the challenge, we started seeing probably eight to 10 years ago, this dramatic decline in outdoor recreation by young adults under age 45. We're starting to get older. Um, we're kind of getting the white hair uh, phenomena in our Minnesota state parks. And when we started to look at these demographic changes, the last time we measured it was in 2012. We're gonna do it again this year and we're hoping that we'll start to see some changes. But you can see that we're only 3% diverse at a time when the state's approaching 20%. That's unacceptable. We're supposed to serve all the citizens of the state. So that's a great concern for us. And that's why we are doing a lot with diversity and inclusion, which I'll share with you some of the things that we're doing today. And we're also following the trends. The largest growth area in the next 15 years, this is not a surprise to any of you, is in the Hispano, Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx market. Um, so then what we did is we sat down about seven years ago and said, oh, what is going on here? What are the uh, reasons that people are not getting out to our state parks? And we looked at the motivations. And it's that natural scenery. When people see these beautiful places, they want to get out to them. They want to um, get away from the stress of everyday life. They want to enjoy the smells and sounds of nature and they want to spend time with their family. And that's why we've chosen our target market to be people aged 25 to 49, with kids aged three to 15 in the household, and then we also have an emphasis on the Hispanic Latino market. So we're here to learn a lot about how to reach that market. We also looked at some of the barriers. Lack of information was one of the key ones. And I've heard that mentioned already today. People just don't know what is out there backyard and what we have in Minnesota for them. Lack of skills. And then there's also all those things you see popping up there with our target market being young families. Young families today have their kids way, way scheduled into soccer hockey dance. It's that syndrome. And they're trying to be good parents and there's nothing against soccer hockey dance, but when we try to get in that schedule, it's a real challenge. So uh, are some of you familiar with Dr. Raintree Salk's work? Have you seen that? She did it in the metro area. She, they did a series of focus groups um, with diverse audiences to find out what their barriers were. So this isn't our research, but we really paid attention to what she learned. And the barriers, again, were that lack of awareness of what's out there, uh, time, so again, the busy families, and then they have, there's a real fear and safety concerns out there. Um, it's like, they just don't know. Like some of us are afraid going downtown Minneapolis or St. Paul, but the same people that might be really comfortable doing that are afraid when they get out in the woods. And some of us might see like a, a trail, a beautiful trail with nobody else on it, and we're thinking, oh, solitude, that's wonderful. And when we showed those pictures to focus group participants, they were like, what would I do if something happened? Who would I call? And then when we showed them pictures of lots of people out there, they were a lot more comfortable. Lack of transportation is another one of those barriers that Raintree found in her research. And then there's also some language barriers. So what did we do about this? We decided we needed to do some product development. And I don't, has anybody here heard of the ICANN series of programs? A few, but we got our work to do with that too, <laughs> get more out there about it. But this is a series of programs. It's everything from I can paddle to I can camp, I can fish, 
and we take a look at um, we took a look at what those barriers were, and we addressed them by providing trained instructors. So if you don't know how to do something, we'll show you how to do that. Equipment. So maybe you don't want to make that investment in a canoe or kayak or a tent until you know that your family is actually going to like those things. Low cost. We think that's an approachable price for a family. There's activities for the family. Because another thing we got in our focus group, people would say, if I take my kids outdoors, what are we going to do? And for those of us who spend time in the outdoors, it's like you don't need to have stuff for kids to do. But that's what parents are thinking, and we have to reach those parents. Just remember, they're used to soccer, hockey, dance, where somebody else is entertaining the kids. You're standing on the sidelines. Now, all of a sudden, as a parent, you're going to be out there doing something with your kids. So we provide those activities. And then um, packing lists, so you don't know how to do it again, we'll tell you what to bring. And it's been really successful. I think a, an important part of it is that we branded it. So having a program that was branding, branded and we stuck, re stuck really strictly to the branding guidelines. And if you look at that title, it's being your kid's hero just got easier. So that appeals to the parent. So we're always trying to appeal to the parent with everything that we do. So the results, now this is from about 2012, and at the time we were not necessarily trying to reach diverse markets, but to, I think Rico's point earlier, sometimes if you can get out there and create that awareness and do that advertising and make your buys in areas that reach your target market and be very disciplined about it, you know, you're gonna go across the whole strata of culture. But if you look down to the, is there a light on this? Oh, there it is. Got it. The other, okay. the other end. Got it. Thank you. So the first year we came up with these branded programs, the only one we advertised was I Can Camp. And look at how we reach diverse markets with that. We weren't even necessarily intending to, but it re reached across the strata. So we're pretty excited about that to see that we reach those kind of numbers. So that was 23% back in 2012 when the population of the state was probably around 15 or 17%. Uh oh, now I'm gonna try to switch from the light to going forward. There we go. The other thing we do, we have really expanded our interpretive program. So this is um, fun family programs. Again, it gives those families something to do and it interprets the natural environment. And then this is just some other things that we've done. Um, because we rely on the beauty of the places that people might be going to, we have virtual tours online right now for all of our Minnesota state parks. So you can go online and look at it, maybe get over some of those fears before you actually go outdoors. We've also come up with something uh, called Park Finder, where you can uh, put in what you're looking for. Let's say you're thinking you want to go out to greater Minnesota, you want to go to a park, and I want it to be, um, to have camping, I want a naturalist program, I want a swimming beach. You just go bing, 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 and it will show you which parks around the state have that. So that's an online tool. And then we've done some uh, translation into Spanish. So I'm really curious to hear more about whether or not it makes sense to be doing that. Um, I was hearing maybe, maybe it's not worth some of the effort to go ahead and do that. I know that when we were at a Cinco de Mayo event, um, the last couple of years we've been there, we had one brochure that we translated into Spanish, and the pickup rate was almost none. I think there were two that were picked up, and we had hundreds of other brochures that were picked up at the same time. So that's an area of learning for us. We're doing a lot with our publications. Um, we're working really hard to try to make sure that the audience we're trying to attract sees themselves in our photos, so on the covers of the brochures, so we've made a real effort to try to do that. And then we're doing a lot with public engagement. We're doing lots of listening sessions, we're going around the state, um, asking people what they want, asking them why they're not coming right now. So we're just doing a lot of listening right now. Um, and then with public relations, um, Rick, I was about ready to 
ask if you wanted a job when you were talking about this in the intro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm always for hiring. All right. <laughs> um, he was speaking so highly about this. And, and to go back to Deborah Locke, who was the first person that I um, introduced. Deborah, would you mind just raising your hand again so people can see who you are? We hired her last August with a specific purpose of doing multicultural media outreach. And it's just been great having her on board. She's an award-winning journalist. And she, she is also a member of, I want to read this so I get it right, Deborah. She's an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa in North Dakota. So she is native to our state. Um, so she's been doing a great job with this. You can see some of the publications. Rick talked about this earlier. Both Deborah and Harlan worked on these. So we're, we're getting the, uh, the earned media out there. And this is what, what these partnerships are all about. We are now just starting to place advertising in multicultural media as well. And we're learning what that is like. We're making some contacts um, with our Feel the Wow of Fall promotion that we do every fall. Uh, you can see that we are on Insight News, La Raza, Univision, and Telemundo. So we're just we're learning where we need to be. We know we want to get to more places. We don't have a huge budget, um, but we're making an attempt to try to get out there and have people see us. And then social media, thanks to Rick, he helped us actually with some of our recruitment. That's what this is about. We're trying to um, also have people in our ranks that look like the people that we're trying to attract into our state parks and trails. And we have a long way to go on that. But thank you, Rick, for helping us out with this. My pleasure. Um, and then we too, um, like the USTA, are getting out there and doing outreach in communities. I mentioned that we've been at Cinco de Mayo for a couple of years now and plan to be there every year going forward. We need to figure out better how to do the engagement when we're at these events, though. I was down there the first year, and somebody next to us had a paint the pony booth. And Kids would come running up to us, and uh, their eyes were big, and I would, oh, they're so glad to see us, and they want to have one of our brochures, and they'd go right past us to the pony. So, <laughs> so we got to find a pony or something. <laughs> um, and then last year, for the first time, we were at the uh, Monarch Festival in Minneapolis, and that has a um, draws a real Hispanic Latino. Um, audience to that. So we're we're looking for more. We want to get out to more of these kind of places. So people see us out in the community and we're doing that reach out with our outreach efforts. And like I mentioned, we're trying to recruit more and that is one of our major initiatives. The governor actually has said that um, he wants us to have 20% uh, people of color. So we're working toward that goal right now. We just had a conference last week. We had James Burroughs, he's the uh, state's chief inclusion officer, come and talk to our staff about how we do that. It, it's just so important to have that element, to have people that are um, like the people that we're trying to uh, attract. So we're doing that. And then just one other initiative that we have going on is a uh, a lot of assessments of ourselves within the State Parks and Trails Division. Um, we're doing something called the IDI. It's a tool where you figure out how culturally competent you are as an individual. I'm seeing heads nodding, people know what this is. And then also how we are as an agency. Because we want to make sure that we make people feel comfortable when they arrive on our doorstep. So we're in the process of doing that right now. I haven't seen my own personal IDI score. I'm really curious and a little like nervous about seeing it. <laughs> and then we're going to be doing a lot of training, cultural diversity training as well, um, just to make sure that we're growing as individuals and as an organization. And then we're doing something else. It's called a Diamond Works uh, assessment. We're looking at our policies and procedures um, and just the way we present our Minnesota State Parks and Trails to make sure that we have a real welcoming environment when you arrive. Deborah did an interview with a gentleman, uh, Jeff Savage. He's a leader um, in the Indian community. And uh, she had to ask him some very candid questions. And we shared it with our, our staff. And he said that he finds like the gates that we have at the entrance of the parks, the permit fees that we have, 
those are all kind of like obstacles and the fact that we all wear uniforms, that that can be daunting for people. So we're just looking at that right now and going, okay, what are some of those barriers? So when people do arrive, they just feel like it's welcome and, the, and it's theirs. And so our goal is to create unforgettable park trail and recreation experience that inspire people to pass along the love for the outdoors to current and future generations. And we want it to be everyone in the state. So what I have now are just uh, a few beautiful shots to end with, with some music, if I can get this to work. Um, and then if you want to think about whether or not you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> And we want to see those smiles on everybody's face in Minnesota. Let's have a hand for Pat. Pat Hi. Well, we are extremely excited to be here. Um, with me today is Shelly Kiala, who's the Ordway's Vice President of Education and Community Engagement, as well as Al Justiniato, uh, the Artistic Director of Teatro. And then... Also here from our team today is Elsa, who you, needs no introduction, <laughs> and uh, Tony Jillick, who is our Vice President of Sales Marketing and Guest Experience, so he told me what to do. But in all seriousness, no, Tony has been um, instrumental in getting some of these initiatives in place and driving them forward. So with that, I will hand it over to Shelly and Al, um, so we'll talk a little bit First about West Side Story and the production itself and some of the initiatives we have going on with that and then we'll um, transition into the marketing side. Shelley. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, thanks again for having us here and thanks to Elsa for making this connection possible. Um, I'm just gonna do a, a very quick introduction to the foundation of um, why, we're, why we're focusing on this collaboration and what it means and then hand it over to the folks that are um, doing the work of getting the word out. Um, You'll see from that first slide that um, really intrinsic to the, to the way that we're working is collaboration. So the Ordway is just across the Wabasha Bridge. Um, we're in the west side of St. Paul right now, which is where Teatro del Pueblo is located. And um, we're one of the largest concentrations of the Latino population, as, as well as a historical um, connection to a Latino identity. So when we, as an organization, we're thinking about doing a production of West Side Story in our season in an upcoming year, um, the only way it made sense to us to move forward was to start with a conversation with the community that is here, that lives um, and is within a Latino and Puerto Rican identity. I'm lucky that I knew Al. Um, I used to work at Teatro del Pueblo <laughs> before I worked at the Ordway. And I also got to know Elsa early in my years at the Ordway. So we, we were able to really um, reach back into relationships that spanned over 15, maybe 20 years of these organizations knowing each other and working together and the individuals in, um, with them. So that's where we started from. It wasn't just a this year we're going to market to this community. It was, it was really starting with going back and um, talking to our friends. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, as mentioned, uh, by the way, my, my Norwegian name is Alberto. <laughs> I am uh, thrilled to be here with you today. Um, like Shelley said, it's really a, a thing about uh, trust. Um, I've known Shelley for many years. Um, how it all started is I was jogging, actually. I was jogging and I got a phone call. I was getting ready to go to uh, an uh, uh, arts equity national conference um, in uh, Oregon. And she called me and she said, we're interested in uh, talking to you about um, collaborating. And 
that she knows. Uh, collaboration is a very, very uh, dear to my heart. Um, I've been studying the collaborative efforts and, and uh, platforms for now many, many years. Um, so uh, when she, she said, well, let's, uh, we're looking at doing, uh, will be interest, there's some interest out there to do uh, West Side Story. So um, and maybe we can uh, include something else. So I'm like, okay, thank you. I have to go this afternoon, fly out. As soon as I come back, I will uh, talk, set up a meeting, and we'll talk. Um, I, if I get involved, I would need to have certain things happen, and that's the only reason I would get involved. Immediately, I hung up with her. I kept on jogging, finished. I called Elsa, my compatriot. Uh, uh, so we said, hey, there's an opportunity. Let's see how we can leverage it for the benefit of our community in, in ways that can be uh, transcending. Uh, it might be an opportunity. So the idea was not to do a one-off. And, and we talked, Shelly, see, trust is such an important aspect of all this, and that takes time. And the good thing is that we have developed that trust. So um, I talked to Shelly about how can we make this a more um, uh, deeper and impactful experience. And Shelly gets it, so it's so easy in that way. Uh, many times it's a lot harder to, 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 to get to that point. So immediately we talked about, okay, no contracts had signed before we talked and get something down. And so we talked, we uh, talked about um, uh, maybe adding another play in the Heights. That was because it was important that not only uh, West Side Story could talk to one generation, but if we are able to expand it to a different generation, it's uh, a play that uh, iconic, another Lin-Manuel, more modern, more um, um, uh, connected to, to the contemporary uh, Puerto Rican um, experience. So I thought, well, if we can do that, then we can stretch this out to a long-term relationship where we both gain. And uh, one of the things that we talked about, and I, I like to talk about this, is about bottom lines. Everybody has some, something that they value. Sometimes what happens is that different organizations, that we're very small. By the way, I'm with Teatro del Pueblo. We're a Latino theater. We're a very small theater located here in the west side. We've been around for about 25 years, going on our 26th year. But um, so, so sometimes uh, part of the conversation is that people don't know what to value. I mean, Teatro del Pueblo, we've been doing 24-7 in this community and throughout the Twin Cities and Minnesota, uh, uh, engaging communities, especially the Latino community but also we do cross-cultural engagement. But the, the key is that what is it that we value and what it is that the Ordway values? Because sometimes we don't ask those questions and that was a process. In, this, in, in setting up a framework, you have to think about the process because once you get to that point or you always, maybe you never get to that point, but you, you, you aspire to get to that point of trust and understanding what is important to the other, not only for the organization, but for each individual. Because people come with more energy when their stakes are in, in play. So it's about discovery. So that took a little while, but I mean, I think, and I don't wanna, uh, you know, I just wanted to set the, the tone of why we're in this collaboration. It's because we find common value. The Ordway has certain values as well as um, uh, bottom lines that are important to them and I can leverage that to make our, what we value important. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are challenges, like in any uh, uh, collaborative framework, there are challenges, but we, with trust, we get to those challenges, we talk, and so there's sometimes push one way and push back. But that's the <coughs> paradigm, that's how we do and progress. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, that we, do, we take ch these challenges and move forward. Um, one of the things, the fallacies that many people, and this is mostly uh, for your um, uh, uh, interest, is that markets are fragmented. We know that. You can't just um, market to one group and, and, and think that, you know, things are different now. People value certain things and you need to find out those values. So in this process, I see it as an experiment. We're hoping to be a national model for other large institutions. 
Uh, Ford Teatro is leveraging the fact that this is a huge organization that will provide some visibility for the theater. We share some of the power, which means sharing funding, which is one of the challenges in how to structure that. Um, because we find that the power is in the money, and I'll be very frank. Um, that will help our institution. Um, and to lift community in different ways that are not the usual one of. And that's what I think this project does. And I'll have Shelly talk a little bit more about that. Sure, I'm going to cruise through a couple slides here. So I'm, I'm just going to build on the thought that was uh, mentioned in the previous presentation about the demographics of the Twin Cities. And um, oh, can you go back for a second? Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, as, as Al mentioned, the building of West Side Story, um, building on West Side Story within the Heights in the upcoming season, even though we're currently marketing West Side Story, is really critical to success because um, as the population um, is growing up, it's becoming more diverse, as we all know. So, uh, so we're able to use West Side Story to message West Side Story, but also to message in the Heights. And that really helps us reach multiple age groups and demographics um, within the community. So uh, that, okay, thank you. So <laughs> Al already spoke to the history of Teatro del Pueblo. I spoke to the Ordway. The Ordway has an education and community engagement program, which is um, where my area is, that reaches back about the same amount of time that Teatro has been around, actually. It started in the early 90s, well before I was there. Um, Elsa, I think you were probably there in the early years. So, uh, so there is a, a rich history there and a lot of folks in the community that have that knowledge of his, and history of, of how the Ordway works and has worked and what the possibilities are that have yet to be achieved, which is what we're working on. So can we move on from that one? Oh, we went backwards. Now we're going to go forwards. Um, so uh, Al talked about the, you know, some of the um, big key cornerstones of this work beyond, so before we start telling the story, what is it that we're trying to do? What is it we're talking about? Um, we're putting on a show, <laughs> that, that's, that's uh, uh, a given, but um, we also are working on authentic collaboration and trying to model that and make that visible to a broader community, not just come to a show, but also what does it look like to have these organizations collaborate authentically? Um, we want to make sure that we're presenting the show in context. We're not taking a show from the past and saying, this is a great historical piece, come see it. We're talking about why is this relevant today? And so part of the ways that we're doing that has to do with programming, but it has a marketing edge to an angle to it as well. So we're surrounding the performance experience with some experiences in community and in the lobbies that um, create that context. So this weekend, we um, Al is co-producing with someone, um, with Dana Martinez, who's at the, at the Ordway, a staff member there. Um, an opportunity to hear some songs being performed by local uh, Latino performers from West Side Story, as well as songs um, that were written from the West Side here from a, a gentleman named Augie Garcia, who some of you may know. There was a show at the History Theater about his work not that long ago. So we're putting those two um, pieces together alongside each other so that the stories of this community and the stories that um, were written for the West Side Story performance have the same level of importance and, that, and we're not um, putting one over the other. And then uh, a par another part of that, I think the name Maria Issa was mentioned here before I walked in the door. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> so um, she, we're, we've been so lucky to watch her grow up artistically in town and she's going to be um, performing at those as well and sharing some of her own, her own work, her own um, pieces to uh, also highlight the fact that there are still stories coming out of the West Side, still stories coming out of St. Paul that are important to pay attention to, just as West Side Story is an important piece to continue to have in front of us. Um, and then we're also working on creating access for audiences in different ways. So the, the events this weekend are free. We also have different tiered ticket prices. Al's been working on getting all kinds of groups access to come see some of the rehearsals so they can be a part of the process. Um, we have some conversations that are happening in the lobbies with uh, Latino um, Puerto Rican leaders in the community. Javier Murillo is, is um, the name of one of those people, and he'll be talking about the identity of uh, his identity and what it means to be Puerto Rican through the lens of West Side Story. So, um, so those are kind of some of the bedrocks of the work we're doing. We also have been collaborating on training. And would you speak? Yeah, to them? I turn it over to Christina for marketing. Yeah. Okay. Um, you see. Everybody takes risk in this, right? I take risk because I'm representing a community, and I should be very, very um, direct about this. I don't represent or know every single Latino. 
I don't, I don't represent Latinos. That's what I wanted to say. We come in all shapes and forms. And what I do is do my best to uh, um, engage our community as Latino. But I just wanted to make sure that it's not a, a monolithic uh, uh, community. But what the risk is, for, and so I stand here, I could be working with a large institution, and I, I take my risk. But the Ordway takes risk because they allow me to go to, into the artistic program, which is very unique. Is it's not. My job is to make sure to include many faces in that that represent our communities. So the challenge with uh, West Side Story is dancers. There are not that many Latino professional dancers, but I know that besides Latino dancers, uh, there are other communities of color. So my, my main thing is to make sure that representation is on, on stage. And that's one of the, the, the things that are very unique about this project is that we have access to that. So I wouldn't have been involved if that wasn't the case. So it's very unique and, and, and thought um, moving. Yeah. Absolutely. So, from, from our perspective, knowing that we have this amazing project and all of these um, great relationships being built, how do we tell the story of what we're doing and get the word out there to talk about West Side Story? So the first piece, we wanted the right people at the table. Um, we built our team, we contacted Elsa through the connection with Shelly, um, and have been working with Al to really understand, um, because as you mentioned, the, the community is it's fragmented. <coughs> Um, and not everyone is the same. So bringing Elsa to the table really helped us to understand, you know, what are the events that we need to be at? What channels do we need to be in? And how do we, how do we make that happen to create really a multifaceted and multi-pronged approach to reach out to and engage the community? So all marketing is about telling a story. It's about bringing a narrative that engages and, you know, tugs people's heartstrings and makes them want to participate and want to be part of the story. Um, so we have to know who we're talking to. And having Elsa on the team really helped us um, understand what that, what that right message was. What are the messages that resonate with those people? So not just um, that we're talking to the Latino community, but what do they care about? Um, how do they engage in their day? What are the messages that resonate with them? And how do we engage and connect in a way that's really meaningful? Um, and narrative goes beyond the sales message. So we are presenting West Side Story, but we're presenting it in a way that's unique and different, as Shelly and Al have been talking about. So how do we make sure that that message is also being, um, being told? So the first step in that is developing strong connections and relationships with the community. Leveraging our team, and this has been talked about a lot today, and I just I think it's so important to understand um, resisting the one-touch approach. It's really easy to engage with the community for a single campaign, and then you know we move on to the next campaign. Everyone gets busy, the relationship falls off, and um, it's not a deep and authentic way to approach those relationships. So we've really been working on being consistent and authentic in our relationships and establishing trust. Um, so rather than advertising in um, La Prensa for just West Side Story, we've worked with the Multicultural Media Consortium through Al McFarlane, through Tom Gita, um, and through others to make sure that we have a consistent presence, that we are, um, that the communities start to think of the Ordway as a place where they're always welcome, they can always come regardless of what our programming is on stage. And that goes beyond, um, beyond West Side Story. So it's about community and it's about relationships. Uh, process and tactics, so some of the tactics that we've implemented for West Side Story and beyond. Collaborations with Latino media companies and larger multicultural media consortium. Uh, personal connections to affinity groups. Uh, personal connections with Latino regional groups and festivals through our public appearances, which Shelley has spoken to a little bit. Um, we've rescaled our houses and we've provided some access programs to reflect kind of the different entry points while also trying to achieve our financial goals. And um, our partners have also been super helpful in um, understanding what those access points are. And developing equitable collaboration with organizations that are already embedded in the target community and who can assist in a more impactful 
way. So some of the amazing things that Elsa has done for us in the community are getting us appearances on um, La Raza, on Spanish language radio programs. Um, we did a recording of a TV program last night with Al McFarlane, um, a multicultural marketing or multicultural outreach program. We had an article that was presented in um, Latino American Today with Rick Aguilar and a number of other different outreach programs that because of Elsa's connections and because of her um, insight and expertise in that area, we were able to, I mean, she knew right away, these are the people we need to talk to, this is what we need to do, um, and that's a level of expertise that, that we didn't have. So making sure that um, you have the right partners at the table is really, really critical. So as a result, we've built some really important community connections. We've developed lasting relationships and we now have ongoing outreach and communication strategies that we'll continue to leverage going forward and the narrative that, that goes beyond a sales message. Um, and just to speak to kind of the, the marketing and advertising piece of that, because I know that's come up a lot. When we have a multicultural cast, we have a training program that's going on. Um, making sure that we are telling that story either implicitly or explicitly in all of our communication. So we've been recognizing the partnership with Teatro and all of our advertising, and we also tried to be intentional when we were doing a photo shoot for the um, media campaign to make sure that we were showing, and would, rather than telling, that we had a multicultural cast and that the community would see themselves represented on stage. Um, I think it was one of our board members that kind of made a joke, but it hits a little too close to home maybe, that the Ordway is really great at 80-year-old white women. <laughs> and, and, and we wanna be more than that, you know, not only because the demographics of our state and our country are changing so rapidly that that's no longer a sustainable strategy, but also because we really truly want to reflect our community. We wanna be a place that reflects the community that we're in. And with that, How about a hand for it sounds great. Thank you.